It's been one month since the deadliest fire in Britain in modern history, and questions about how it happened loom as ominously as the charred tower still standing over London. How a refrigerator fire managed to engulf the 24-story Grenfell Tower in a matter of minutes, taking the lives of at least 80 people, has left a community in disbelief and outraged. Tonight, the emotional eyewitness accounts from survivors who take us inside the horrifying inferno. Here's ABC's James Longman. I got woken up by the noise from outside. Fire, fire. <gasps> Oh. People shouting, help, I'm on the 14th floor. <laughs> need to move now, please. Red flames and the smoke was very, very intense. I've never seen a fire like this. I've never seen people die like this. It felt like an action slash horror movie. But you're in it. It's been a month since the fire at Grenfell Tower lit the skies over London. This wasn't meant to happen, man. Like, this little boy doesn't deserve it. At least 80 lives stolen in the darkness, 120 homes destroyed, families ripped apart. Now, the public housing tower, once home to about 600 residents, stands a dark shadow over this city, a looming reminder of the heartbreak and heroism from that night. It was just before 1 a.m. when the first calls came in to authorities. The cause now said to be a faulty fridge on the fourth floor. Our first fire engine attended this incident within six minutes. It wouldn't normally have been a problem. But this fire was different. It was just unprecedented. You know, you don't get fires spread that quickly. This, we know, went from the fourth floor to the 18th floor in about eight minutes. 20 after one. 11th floor resident Muna El Ogbani got a call from a friend telling her to get out. We went and waked up the children, they were asleep. Uh, my son, he wanted to put his shoes on, I said I haven't got time, just get out. When I opened the door, just a big black smoke blazed into the house, I started to panic. Three floors above, Oluwasen Talabi woke up in his unit where he lived with his girlfriend and daughter. They're tying things together like blankets. I went around every room in the house screaming, fire, fire, help, please, help, help. I've got a child here, help, please. Downstairs, onlookers watched in horror. It was Armageddon. People running around and lots of people just standing and staring and watching the horror unfold in front of their eyes. Oh, my God. <gasps> oh. The screams that I heard, there were screams of desperation. There were screams like, when you have nothing else to do, those were the screams. Then the fire brigade came in and they said, uh, listen, your flat seems to be the safest flat at the moment. Can we bring some of your neighbours into your house? Neighbours poured in. Some would never leave. I can remember one of them sitting on my bed, reading this Koran. Um, the little boy, the two years old boy that died, um, at the top of the bed, my daughter on the same bed with him. Fire brigade guy opened the fire door exit to go through the stairs and uh, he just telling people to get out. So literally I was going rushing down the stairs, just reciting Koran to calm me down a bit. It's only when I get to the bottom of the floor that I saw how serious it was the fire and how quick it was spreading. My husband was saying, just don't look, but you can't. It was mesmerizing and there was nothing we could do. We knew it was killing people. You could see the people on the top floor with the flashlights, the torches, the towels. You could hear the voices. For Piers and Tanya Thompson, their bedroom window became a front row seat in those deadly hours. Particularly on this side here, which is the west side. I remember someone up there, probably the second floor down. Right up there, the second yeah. floor down. That's where we could really see the people. And my neighbor was in his garden, you know, shouting up at the building. Get out, get out. I mean, sort of, it's futile, isn't it? Still inside, Oluwasen readied his makeshift rope fashioned from bed sheets. And I tied it around the window, tied it so hard, as, as hard as I could. And people were telling me, no, what are you doing? Don't do it. But I wasn't looking to die in there. And I told my partner to pass me my daughter. But my daughter wasn't having it. She was crying. She was like, like, almost like, what are you doing? So now my daughter isn't coming. 
now I've got to get back into the flat because I'm not going to go down without my daughter. So now I'm finding it difficult to get back into the flat because I'm dangling from outside of the window from the 14th floor. His neighbours pulled him back in, saving his life before losing their own. The fire brigade has come and said, run! I've grabbed my missus by hand. My daughter tied to my back already. And I didn't look back. I don't know who followed us. I don't know who stayed in the building. We just ran. It's 14 floors. Trust me, I gave up on the 10th floor. God took me downstairs. I don't what know. was going through your mind? It was like, um, in Arabic, we say Jahannam, which is like... Um, Catastrophe. Yeah. We are on our way to the Al Manar Mosque. Um, it's become a bit of a refuge for witnesses and for survivors of that fire. We come upon a funeral. Witnesses say the victim suffered smoke inhalation and died after making her way out of the tower. So many here touched by tragedy. And who is it that you're missing? Well, my brother-in-law, my wife's brother, his wife and three children, aged 21, 16 and 8. And when you think about them now, I mean, how does this... It's completely wasted life. They, should, they, they, they shouldn't disappear just like that. If there were precautions, they would still be alive. Inside, we meet Hassan Awad Hassan. He sits with a photograph of his family, wife Rania, and daughters Fatia and Hania, five and three. All perished in the fire. My daughter's five years. She said to the guy, I'm not going to cry from this fire. Because my dad is coming. Can you feel that? That's what all I can say. She didn't scare from the way because he said, I'm coming to help her. Hassan was away caring for his sick brother in Egypt on the phone with his wife Rania as the flames licked at their doorstep. I tell her immediately, can you go down? She tell me no. The people tell, you tell her you have to stay there. I tell her, don't worry, just stay inside, close the door, and everything will be fine. But there's no help at all. There's no help. Oh, don't open the front door. Okay, don't, don't open, open the front door. You're going to bring the smoke in. Okay. You're not going to be able to breathe. Your I'm children scared, maybe someone outside. Rania posting this harrowing video on Facebook Live. Where's You've put the photo there. Can you describe them? What were they like? Your family? I meet her in this mosque here. Before she's coming to visit her sister. And then we get married. What will you remember about, about them? I remember my two daughters every day speaking, talk to me. We're waiting for you. And I'm not going to forget anything. This is going to be in my, in my life, in my heart, in everywhere, all until I've been dying. Heartbreak engulfing so many lives. So how did a fridge fire in one unit consume an entire building within minutes? When we come back, <laughs> the investigation and alarming findings Justice for Grenfell! as outrage over the government's response grows. That video was a death trap. 